arts community between organization and artists um, because I sort of found myself in uh, arts administration haphazardly, like I think maybe a lot of people do, <laughs> um, coming out of college with uh, some kind of arts degree. And I think that as, as the word of our name is kind of, we kind of don't love it, even though we embrace it. <laughs> but, you know, as we're talking, I love it too. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, because there isn't a lot of money in this 
era. So that, I think, is a very, very exciting thing. And um, the arts and culture at a core, I think, you know, to the extent that the arts community is involved, people really get that. People in the arts community don't want it to just be used in urban development. <laughs> they don't want it just to be used to turn off their neighborhood. Yeah. So, you know, if they really feel like, you know, they are partners and they have ownership of it, and they're listening for the first time to people who have a lot of skills, you know, in urban design or transportation or healthcare, whatever it is that's the bridge, um, you know, they're gonna learn a lot, but they're gonna be true to their artistic mission core and skills. So that's why I am continuing to really believe it has great potential, but it also needs a lot of thought and a lot of, you know, all of these kinds of things that could really, really help us talk about. <laughs>
But actually, something you said the other night in the car, I think, Susan, you said it, that, you know, actually what Phoenix is really built on is real estate and banking. Yeah. I think it's really important to understand how the character of the growth of Phoenix in the last two or three decades has, you know, so warped the character of its population. So you have huge numbers of people who just come here part time to be a wealthy people uh -huh. who are really choosing to live in very, very same like, you know, yeah. same income class, same color people areas. And um, it's also very unsustainable. I mean, the canals, right. the water, the, the water issue in Phoenix, I, I think there's tremendous potential for the arts and cultural um, community to really work with the environmental community and the health community um, around, you know, kind of being reflective in a critical way about canals here. You know, what are the canals about? They're about bringing this, diverting all this water and bringing it to a place that was really meant to be a desert. And, you know, which it could be livable, but it has to be, you know, lived in a really different way. So I just wanted to raise those things because I just think, you know, those are other ways that you can really serve a broad community and, and really start a lot of conversations to be really, you know, um, critical about the political economy and the environmental ecology. Well, yeah, and I love that, and like that idea that we, we spend a lot of time talking about how we have to understand an, an individual's context in order to work with a group of individuals but like you're saying, we also have to understand the context of the city itself if we're trying to affect that kind of widespread change in order to really find the roots, to work from the roots of the problems. Did I mention air conditioning? <laughs> How <laughs> Anyway, you know, just, yeah. Yeah, well actually the canals, one of the reasons we have the canals is So with this talk of you know this you know it's all of this potential uh, vibrant environment that we can create with you know this arts and culture, like well, how do you guys um, think or view um, your audience? Like how like how, how do you guys kind of conceive that in relation to this idea of Phoenix, you know, potentially being this great city that involves our arts and culture? So. Yeah, <coughs>
Um, how, how do we talk about it? So, so is your question, Alex, how, how do we engage, continue to engage the communities that already exist, or how do we engage the, those older communities in? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess I'm kind of asking, like, how do, how, like, how do we expect to, um, to create these different, like, <laughs> like, art, like art and culture if we don't um, support these sort of interests? And how do we expect to spark that interest in the community and, and gather an audience? Um,
not seen that in the buildings that they are doing things. They might belong to the Playwright Center or participate. Wait, but those are all with other artists. Exactly. No, 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 the Loft, no, the Loft Literary Center has tons of people coming in who are just regular folks who want to learn how to, they have book clubs in there, they have a lot of, it is a space where audiences come together with artists who are beginning wannabe artists who didn't get it in school can learn those things from seasoned artists. It's really amazing in that way. There's an apprenticeship there that is really extraordinary. And if you think about intermediate arts or juxtaposition arts or interact, all of these places that are neighborhood oriented, they are doing amazing things in their neighborhood and they're building audiences. And they, that is having that dedicated space where people feel a belongingness, not just the artists. It's not just about the artists. It's other people who are art lovers who come to intermediate to see performances like me or to come to the gallery and see the show. So I, I think that I'm just making a pitch for that. I'm, and I also want to just totally second what you're saying about we should ask something from artists in return. And the new art home you know, um, project, for instance, every, every artist who gets help from them, they're asked to give something back to the community. I, I think that is really true. So that artists should really uh, you know, be asked to give something back and should be formalized in some way. And that, that's a job for our funders and the other people who are supporting that project. So what, what are some of the conversations like in Seattle or in Lubbock or in Austin surrounding some of these issues of place and, and, and the artists? Yeah. Well, I, I think Austin's a really interesting um, cautionary tale, if you will, or just an, it's interesting um, genealogy of, of festivals and different types of support for the arts. Um, I'm a transplant from Manhattan to Austin, and so I've learned a lot about um, the, the, the fine arts, high art that's gone on there, as well as kind of the, the, the community-based and divide sort of pieces um, and sort of you know, east side art, if you will, where I live. Um, uh, but uh, it's, if you want to get a sense of how, like South by Southwest is a great example of a festival that started back in the, in the Somebody in here knows. Who did that presentation? South by Southwest? Yeah. Uh, 17 years ago, I think. Yeah. And, and you know, it was like this kind of like print rock festival that is now a very commercial enterprise that like everyone who has, you know, the extra thousand dollars in their pocket can go enjoy. So those of us that like would have gone 17 ago and they don't have that thousand dollars, we go to the um, South by San Jose, which is a free music at the San Jose Hotel, or we go to Gay by Gay Gay um, to see the <laughs> artists, or we try to get into the interactive, and, and um, but it's interesting. So as South by Southwest has grown, it's also been this sort of breeding ground for a lot of other fringe festivals that used to, that are now like what South by Southwest used to be. So it's an interesting sort of conflagration of like all this stuff. And then you've got, you know, the east side versus the west side um, in terms of space. A lot of people are looking at the east side in terms of what spaces are available and how they're being used. Um, you might know of the Root Next who are, who have this great work on the east side that they've had forever and a day that they loan out to other uh, great new screen. I saw some great pieces there. So, so um, the root max are the mechanicals. That's funny because um, they just got this huge prize as well. Well, that's not what's funny about it. What's funny about it is, is um, this: the title of this symposium got posted uh, because of the live streaming and whatnot, and, and on Twitter, and and uh, we had there was a little dust up between us on Twitter about um, sort of gentrification and creative place making, right. how they're feeling they're getting priced out of their Yeah, and we actually don't have time to open that conversation today because I wanted to um, 
so to start to wrap things up, there's an analogy or a metaphor I've been using lately of a big tent. Yep. Um, and I think that the big tent can enclose both artist spaces and arts and community shared space because I, I think in, in the Valley, anyway, one of the conversations we have a lot, we heard it from the Collab Arts team this morning, is artists need space to some place to gather together. You know, right now they can do that a little bit at our Fine Arts Center here on campus because they're still in school. But you know, where, where do you guys get together? You know, to talk about stuff. You go to other people's events, but there's not a place, right? Phoenix Center for the Arts is a, more of a community center, so community people go to Phoenix Center for the Arts to, to do sort of art, community arts participation. But artists don't go there so much. Unless you're taking a class, you're teaching a yeah, class. You're teaching a class, right? So we don't we don't have those kind of spaces that Phoenix has, or the kind of organizational structure that Phoenix Campus has, and we don't have kind of large um, destination festival that Austin has, um, or the depth of arts and culture that Seattle has. So we have all of that, but we still have problems. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, and I'm, I'm from New York City, and there's problems there too, you know, which we're, you know, you, well, I still am biased in thinking it's, you know, the center of the arts and culture world of the, of the United States, which it's not. One of the things I realized, well, no, I don't think so. I don't think the I don't think there's a center anymore. I don't think there's a center in the United States. I really don't. Um, and I only know that from leaving New York and living in the Midwest for a long time and then living here for nine years, that, that arts and culture happen everywhere. And I'm going to use that phrase, arts and culture happen everywhere, to say that arts entrepreneurship can happen everywhere, too. And if any if uh, colleagues from some other arts entrepreneurship programs were listening in, this, this weekend, they might say, that's not arts entrepreneurship. They aren't talking about you know starting their businesses. Well, starting a business is just one little piece of what arts entrepreneurship is. Right? So seeing these opportunities, working with communities, making art for yourself and for others, and, and getting something new out of the world is sort of all part of it. And I, I see creative placemaking, this movement, as an opportunity for artists, and it's an opportunity for communities, and it's an opportunity for artists and communities to come together under this big tent. And it required, I mean, one of the reasons that uh, a year ago we decided to make this the theme of the symposium was because I had read Pam's paper, and you know, one of the key points that you make is that every project requires an initiator. It requires a person. It requires an entrepreneur. You know, somebody who's going to start something and see it through and actualize it. Um, and that's sort of the connection for me between arts entrepreneurship and creative placement. Sitting, and we're all sitting here. Um, so that's sort of my closing statement. And I'm happy to not have the last word if somebody else would like to. Tamika. Can I do something with that? I, I like your statement that, that art, cult, uh, arts and culture is happening everywhere. And I'm going to segue because a lot of places that I come from, it's not happening everywhere. But it should be happening everywhere. Okay. And so I think our, from what I learned today and, and yesterday about placemaking, and us as social entrepreneurs and, and arts entrepreneurs is that we need to be going in those spaces where art is not. I want to see the ballet in South Phoenix. I want to see the ballet in, in on the west side, in Levine, in these areas that we don't go to. I want to see those communities coming together. Um, and not just a lot of times artists, they'll stay together. Like we do a lot of things downtown or Scottsdale will stay in Scottsdale. They may venture out to Tempe or downtown they're not gonna go that much further. So I think as us, for placemaking, we need to be more conscious as artists and entrepreneurs of those places and making them, don't going out of our comfort zone. We want those people to come. Don't assume that they won't come because they don't have culture or don't assume that they won't drive that far because they will, but we have to make those spaces um, available and welcoming to them to want to come. And we have to be open and welcoming to them to come into those spaces as well. Um, and I think that is where we're, the sprawl is happening, where everyone's staying in their pocket and we're not venturing out. And I think art so, should be happening. So let me, let me pick up on this notion of venturing out mm -hmm. to segue to the closing event of our symposium, which is the Feast on the Street, <laughs> which is happening on First Street in downtown Phoenix. And we do want to encourage everybody to go. And it would be lovely if everybody could go together. And Hannah Cooper, if you want to raise your hand. Hannah Cooper is here to, um, among other things, um, help guide those of you who would like to take the light rail to um, to the event downtown. 
they can travel with Anna and she will guide you there. Um, and with that, I will say thank you very much. I will ask the